If one says the king of Cretaceous North America, many will probably first think of the T-Rex thanks to its widespread reputation. In fact, some believe that the T-Rex and its tyrannosaurid relatives were the only carnivores to have a go at ruling Cretaceous North America. However, there was another king that wasn't the T-Rex nor a tyrannosaur, rather a carcharodontosaurid. It was a behemoth of a carnivore that ravaged the lands and was actually the second largest theropod to exist in North America during the Cretaceous period, second only to the T-Rex, and it was the Acrocanthosaurus. As the runner-up to the T-Rex, the Acrocanthosaurus was without a doubt a force to be reckoned with. When its remains were first found in the 1940s, it was clear that it was a giant, but it was only during the 1990s, when more complete specimens were located, that its size was really understood. And based on the specimens, paleontologists estimated that the largest individuals could reach 11.5 meters or 38 feet in length, making them equal to, and even larger than some famous T-Rex specimens like Titus and Stan. All Although, due to it being more narrow and less robust, the Acrocanthosaurus was lighter than the T-Rex, though how much lighter is uncertain. Originally, paleontologists believed it to be around 4.5 tons, while recent studies have provided a weight range of between 3.6 and 5.5 tons, and some think it could have been even heavier, possibly reaching more than 6 tons. The immense size of Acrocanthosaurus did not only make it a fascinating creature, but also the apex predator of its time, allowing it to hunt a mix of prey, which paleontologists believe included ornithopods, ankylosaurs, and most interestingly, sauropods. This belief that it was a giant killer came from a discovered sauropod that had teeth marks on its bones, which resembled those of Acrocanthosaurus. It is thought that it specifically hunted the sauropod Astrodon and possibly the enormous Sauroposeidon, though it would have almost certainly only targeted vulnerable or younger individuals. The Acrocanthosaurus tackling such large prey led to questions on how it was able to achieve such a feat, and from the discovered bite marks, it was obvious that its mouth was a part of the answer. It was filled with numerous large dagger-like teeth that were serrated and curved, perfect for cutting deep into flesh, and it helped that it had a powerful bite, with one study reporting that it could administer 16,900 newtons of force at its maximum, making it eight times stronger than the bite of a black bear. This powerful bite was thanks to its massive skull, which could reach 1.23 meters or 4 feet long. Yet, although the skull was indeed huge, it was still easily wieldable as it was narrow and sported a large opening in front of the eyes, which made the head lighter than the skulls of other large theropods, relatively speaking. This allowed the Acrocanthosaurus to easily move its mouth when attacking prey, a useful feature. Though despite the clear deadliness of its bite, it wasn't enough to make taking down sauropods easy, which is why the Acrocanthosaurus had another asset, its forelimbs. Paleontologists noticed that they were well built and would have been highly muscled. Furthermore, the arm bones didn't fit together in many of the joints, indicating the presence of a lot of cartilage, which led researchers to believe that the Acrocanthosaurus used its arms a lot, and since they were not long enough to be used for locomotion, it was decided that they were most likely utilized for killing, and this belief was backed by the presence of three razor-sharp claws on each hand, with the first digit having the largest claw. However, despite the vast majority agreeing that the arms were used for hunting, exactly what their specific role was is uncertain, and this is actually the same case for its mouth, which has led to multiple theories on its hunting methods. The most accepted one so far is that because the arms didn't extend that much, the Acrocanthosaurus would have attacked head first, latching onto prey with its massive jaws, where it would then follow up by hooking the victim with its claws to prevent any escapes. Additionally, it's thought that with medium-sized prey, it would pull the animal towards its body with its arms, while with larger prey, it would pull itself towards the animal, where it would then deliver fatal bites. There is also some more creative ideas on how it hunted, including that it would push animals over with its arms. However, this is unlikely as its legs were robust and well-designed for maintaining balance, indicating it fought prey that was standing and moving around. And if a killer bite and lethal claws weren't enough, then it's a good thing that some paleontologists believe that the Acrocanthosaurus was a pack hunter. This conjecture stems from the famous Glen Rose Trackway, where theropod tracks belonging to multiple individuals were found moving the same way as 12 sauropods. 
It has long been thought that these tracks were of Acrocanthosaurus origins, leading to the idea it was a pack hunter. Yet while certainly possible, a few paleontologists are not convinced, pointing out that some of the footprints overlap, and that none of the sauropods' footprints show signs of changing gait, which could be expected from an animal being attacked. However, even if it wasn't a pack hunter, it's still agreed that the Acrocanthosaurus was unusually good at tackling prey larger than itself and its unusualness doesn't end here, as it possessed another highly unique aspect, one that is blatantly obvious and partially led to its fame, its neural spines. These elongated spines were located on its vertebrae, running down its neck, back, hips, and part of the tail. They were more than twice the length of the vertebrae from which they were attached to, and while this isn't as extreme as the Spinosaurus' spines, which were multiple times longer, it still garnered the interest of many, and even led to its name, Acrocanthosaurus, which means the high-spined lizard. No one is exactly sure what these spines looked like in real life, if they led to a small sail or hump, though in more recent times, it's been noted that the spines would have packed quite a bit of muscle, leading to the consensus that its appearance would have been more like a hump or ridge. And regarding its purpose, scientists think it could have been used for anything from communication to temperature control, fat storage, or even for intimidation against rivals. Whatever they were used for, the neural spines were surely no inhibitor to the success of the Acrocanthosaurus, who was the main ruler of North America during the middle and late stages of the early Cretaceous, mainly residing in Texas, Oklahoma, and Wyoming, although it may have had an even more extensive range, as partial evidence of its presence has been found in Maryland. Also, since it was the largest carnivore around at the time, the Acrocanthosaurus was able to extend into a mix of environments, yet it showed a preference for habitat close to the water, as in Texas it lived in floodplains and mudflats that were close to the coastline. During this time, Texas was also partially flooded, and the Acrocanthosaurus would see the continuation of this flooding as a shallow sea was formed. Thanks to its wide distribution, Acrocanthosaurus coexisted with many walks of life, including some well-known dinosaurs like Sauropelta, Tenontosaurus, Deinonychus, and the previously mentioned sauropods, as well as Iguanodontia and Oviraptorsauria. And in regards to the presence of Deinonychus, scientists believe it posed next to no threat to adult Acrocanthosauruses due to the size difference. There were also non-dinosaurs, including Neosuchians, mammals, fish, lizards, and turtles. Yet once again, none of these creatures, specifically the carnivorous ones, came close to reaching the size of the Acrocanthosaurus, reinforcing it as the king. But this didn't mean it was immune to threats, as some specimens have been found with damage to the skull and neural spines. But what caused the damage is unknown, perhaps rival Acrocanthosaurus or struggling large prey. And unfortunately, all of its traits and features that made it the apex predator didn't protect it from its eventual demise and the Acrocanthosaurus eventually faded away, before the late Cretaceous and before the emergence of the T-Rex, which is unfortunate, as it would be interesting to know how the two would have interacted if they ever met.